team. The owners of the famous 1928 schooner, the Nina, are preparing to go to sea. On board are some very talented people. The owners, David Dyke, Rosemary Dyke, and young David Dyke IV, have made the Nina a life project. They renovated the historic yacht and were on the next leg of a transworld cruise. This was to be David's last trip because he is getting ready to go to college. In order to make the trip, the Dykes recruited crew, including Professor Evie Nemeth, a brilliant mathematician and the author of multiple Linux books. Evie is known to be a stickler in her navigational details. Also aboard is Matthew Wooten, the only person not from the US. Matthew is a prominent member of the Green Party. He is hitchhiking on boats on a three and a half year journey in which he is advocating for a variety of people who traditionally have no voice, including 300,000 children who die each year of diarrhea simply because they don't have clean water. I'm cycling down in Ecuador, down from the Andes mountains towards the western edge of the Amazon rainforest. And the Amazon is huge, thousands and thousands of miles in several countries, Ecuador, Colombia, Peru, and largely in Brazil. And because this nice man who works for the hydroelectric company up ahead told me, and because it says so on the map, and because I can see palm trees now, I think this is it. This is the western edge of the Amazon rainforest. And the first thing that I see, apart from the palm trees, of course, is a hydroelectric plant that's gonna take us on to four degrees and five degrees and six degrees. And once we get to six degrees, there's not gonna be very much of this world left. And literally millions of people, billions of people are going to die. And that will happen, we'll be on a snowball effect down the hill for that to happen once we get to three degrees, when the Amazon starts going up. And it's already being industrialized, apart from the fact that just the rising temperature is gonna be what's gonna do it in. So, a couple of things. Enjoy life while you can. And let's not try to screw everything up completely to make sure that, yeah, we can have children and our children and hopefully even our grandchildren can enjoy this life and this world. It's about water. It's about the water that I'm drinking. It's about the water that you drink. It's about the water that a billion people in the world don't get to drink. It's about the evils of bottled water, and they are evils. And it's about the 2,000 children a day that die through water-related disease. in the Caribbean. The Dykes invited the entire Wright family to go on this trip, but Danielle asked her parents to give her the chance to spread her wings. And stay home, Mom and Dad. The Wrights, having homeschooled Danielle, felt she was ready to meet the world, so they gave her the trip to New Zealand as an early birthday present and agreed not to go.
is an adventurer and brings a smile to everyone's face. Kyle is also a survivalist who prefers living in a tent in the mountains to living in town. Those survivalist skills were surely to come in handy. Something terrible is about to happen to the Nina. And this film is about what may have happened and perhaps ways to prevent it. The story is told with archival footage and some animation. We start our story with one of the last phone calls home, a video call made to mom by Kyle Jackson. Hey, mom. Oh, uh, you know, I'm gonna try doing this video thing more often, uh, mostly just because I think it's fun to see where I'm at and the environment I'm in, which is right now the port town of Opua. And right there is Wonderland, which is my friend Weston's aunt's boat. Her name is Evie, and she has been sailing for 12 years after she retired from being a computer science professor in Boulder, University of Colorado in Boulder. She's been sailing the high seas ever since, and so Wes and I have been hanging out here for the past couple days. I'm trying to get the lighting right, there we go. Hanging out here for the past couple days, and we are going to be setting sail today into the Bay of Islands and working our way down to Fungare, which is down south on the North Island, where we're going to get the boat ready to go to Fiji. I'm going to go to Fiji, Mom. I guess I just tell you right now, because, yeah, be honest. Uh, and maybe go to Australia before then. And so how the boating world works is that the captain or the owner of the boat will need crew. And they need people to help kind of set the sails and do night watch, because the boat sails throughout the night. And so there's somebody that has to make sure that the boat stays on course and that it doesn't I guess run into anything while on course. I don't know. About to figure it all out. Um, but anyway, I guess now would be a good time to tell you because I'm in that mood of being honest that I'm going to Fiji and we'll be leaving. <laughs> if I do go to Australia, we'll be leaving for Australia on May 14th, which is the day before my ticket comes back. So uh, more developments on all that and what that all means for my life afterwards. But trust that I'm very, very excited to learn um, all about the sailing world, because really people need crews to go on their sailboats um, to help them make large passages from place to place, from like port to port, and so it's kind of a way of like hitchhiking for free, and I mean it is, well yeah, hitchhiking for free, and I get to go on a sailboat the whole way. It's really incredible. Um, I'll tell you more about that. That's a dinghy. That's how people get from their boat to the port, which is yeah, right over there. So, um, and good on you, as they say here in New Zealand. Good on you, mate. Um, I love you much. And yeah, whoop, yep, raindrop. There we go. <laughs> Enjoy the day. I love you, mom. Bye. And so, the Nina departed from New Zealand. You can bet it was a lot of fun. With all those characters on board, maybe music, laughs, excitement. Hey, we're going to Australia. On my 
ain't many clown on our team. Wyangra, Evie Nemeth, calls New Zealand weatherman Bob McBavitt. The weather's turned nasty. How do we get away from it? Evie Nemeth asked. Bob says, I'll pull some weather and get right back to you. And then he replied back, go south. By 9 p.m. tonight local, heave to. Brace for a southwest storm, 50 knots. Gusting, 75 knots. That's 86 miles an hour. Swell forecast to rise to around 7 to occasional 10 meters, 32 feet during Tuesday. survived the night because the next day heavy Nemeth sent a text message to Bob any updates for Nina Southwest wind peak at 45, gusting to 60 knot. Bob make that. Hey. Thanks. Storm sail shredded last night. Now bear poles going four knots, 310 degrees. We'll update course information at 6 p.m. Heavy Nemo. When 6 p.m. came around, there was no update call from Evie Nemeth. Evie always did what she said she was going to do. You would think getting lost at sea would be about the worst thing that could happen to anyone. As it turned out, 
That's where the nightmare began. Convincing the authorities that someone really is lost at sea turned out to have its own challenges, as the families of the crew members would soon find out, both in the region and in the United States of America. Hi, Libyan lads. My last record for Evie was four days ago. Have you any word for spot info? Sorry for any inconvenience caused. Regards, Curly Carswell, partner, Evie Nemeth. Swell should be easing now. Okay to go west, but another front Saturday, near Gale Southwest, until Sunday. How is weather in progress today? Bob McDavid. Curly Carswell contacts the Australian authorities. The Nina is scheduled to arrive in Newcastle, Australia. Curly Carswell calls yachting friends, asking them to contact the Rescue Coordination Center, New Zealand. Clearly, there has been a breakdown in communications. The Rescue Coordination Center, New Zealand, claims this is the first time they have heard the Nina is missing. Unfortunately, the RCCNZ does not view the reporting of an overdue boat with the same urgency as the families view it. The RCCNZ does not see the failure to report by the Nina as an emergency. They later explain to the families, thousands of boats report out of communications each year. Most of those boats turn up in port. Some simply fail to communicate well with relatives. Others get blown off course, while still others lose radio antennas or their communication devices fail, but they show up anyway. The RCCNZ refuses to launch a physical search for the Nina until the Nina is overdue at her destination in Newcastle, Australia. Worse, the RCCNZ refuses to accept the itinerary of Captain David Dyke with an anticipated arrival date of June 10th. Instead, they say the date was ambitious. They reset an arbitrary date for arrival of June 25th. Australia said they didn't have the responsibility of looking for the Nina because her last known position was in the New Zealand area of responsibility. New Zealand said the anticipated itinerary of David Dyke was optimistic, and so they wanted to give extra time for the yacht to arrive. The United States of America said, New Zealand is the one to know the best about how to search the New Zealand area of responsibility. The families are trapped between three rescue organizations, but remember, Evie Nemeth is a brilliant mathematician and known to be a stickler for navigation. In fact, her partner Curly Carswell says she's a pain in the butt for getting her navigation exactly right. Family members want to know if this was the son or daughter of one of the RCCNZ officials would they have waited 21 days to start a search? How would you feel? 15 days after the Nina is scheduled into port and 21 days since her last communications, the RCCNZ finally begins a physical search. In delaying the search date, the RCCNZ fails to take into account the Nina went through near typhoon-sized wind and waves and that the crew of the Nina, including Captain David Dyke, are seasoned sailors who would not miss a position check unless an emergency had come to pass. On June 26, the Royal New Zealand Air Force performs a radar search along Nina's path from Cape Rainga to Newcastle, Australia and back. While there is some debate about how effective the Israeli ELTA radar system is 
in the SP-3 Orions, it is generally believed the radar is line of sight, meaning they can't see over the horizon or through waves. While the RCCNZ suggest searching on 160 mile grids, that is 80 miles each side of the aircraft, the New Zealand Air Force increases their search grid by 240 miles or 120 miles on each side of the aircraft. With the aircraft traveling at 200 miles an hour, it would be difficult to spot the blip of a wooden Nina lying low in the water. The RCC also said the crew had three ways to communicate, by the spot tracker, by the satellite phone, and by an emergency position indicating radio beacon. None of these methods were used, so the RCC and Z said they were justified in not launching a search for 21 days. Emergency position indicating radio beacon, also known as an EPIRB. This handy device is allowing search and rescue coordinators from the Coast Guard to take the search out of search and rescue. It's a very simple process. When a boater is in distress, they can activate their EPIRB, which transmits a signal to the satellite, which is then relayed to the Coast Guard. From there, we evaluate the signal and launch the appropriate asset. Although having an EPIRB can greatly increase your chances of survival in a distressed situation, failing to register your EPIRB and keep your information up to date can significantly increase Coast Guard response time. Absolutely. The Coast Guard cannot stress enough the importance of registering your EPIRB. Thank you, Petty Officer Bannon. Today we're just going over a new piece of equipment, which is the, the DF uh, backpack. It's basically a portable way of finding a signal which is emitted either from a VHF radio or an EPIRB. Contrary to popular reports, the Nina had an updated 406 kilohertz emergency position indicating radio beacon. Uh, it cuts down a lot of time that we're spending searching around areas with, uh, with our small boats and it just basically lets us find the person in distress a lot quicker. Additionally, we are told that these EPIRBs can be purchased online or at boating stores ranging from about $400 to $1,400. And the Coast Guard stresses that you cannot place a price tag on a human life. Reporting from Coast Guard Station, Miami Beach, Petty Officer Nick Amin, 7th Coast Guard District. Thank you, Petty Officer Amin. Also, the Coast Guard urges boaters to wear a life jacket, file a float plan, and have a working VHF radio on board their vessel. For the 7th Coast Guard District, I'm Petty Officer James Harless. There were many inaccurate reports in the press about the Nina. One suggested the Nina was not in good shape, despite a 2012 survey certifying the Nina was in sound condition. Another article said the Nina did not have the necessary emergency equipment aboard. Indeed, the Nina did have the necessary equipment aboard, including an eight-man life raft, flares, and as a Coast Guard officer said, a VHF radio. What didn't the Nina have? A long-range ham radio and the generator needed to power it. The lack of the generator may be what caused the satellite phone and the spot tracker to fail. The only way to charge batteries is running the engine on the Nina. If the engine ran out of fuel, there would be no way to run radios or charge satellite phones. EPIRBs are more reliable, but are also prone to failure. Remember the last known position given by Evie Nemeth? The RCC and Z insisted on searching using the position coordinates obtained from the Iridian satellite phone Evie Nemeth used to send text to Bob McDavid, instead of the coordinates given by Evie Nemeth. Finally, Iridium advised the RCC and Z that Iridium coordinates over water are often hundreds of miles off course. During the last two days of the physical search, the RCC and Z agreed to use Evi Nemus reported position coordinates instead of Iridium coordinates. 29 days had passed since the last communication from the Nina. Over 200 miles separated the Iridium satellite coordinate and the position reported by Professor Evi Nema on June 3rd. The first day search was over 500 miles east of New Zealand. No matter whose search coordinates you use, Evi Nemeth or the Iridium satellite coordinates, neither could be that far east of New Zealand.
If the Ninja crew took to a life raft, they needed help in those very first few days. If a catastrophic event occurred, which prevented the sailors from getting to a life raft, they needed help in the first hours of June 5th. The RCC and Z used helicopters, PK-3 Orion jets, and private aircraft to search for the Nina. But despite realizing how large the search area had grown, the RCC and Z refused to call for help. The U.S. Navy was scheduled to go on maneuvers in the area, but was not called upon. The use of high-technology satellite images were not used either, unlike a later search effort for an airliner that disappeared in the region, MH Flight 370. Because the Nina was drifting, by the time the physical search was launched, the search area had grown to hundreds of thousands of square miles. After searching for nine days, only two of which were on Evi Nemeth's coordinates, the RCC and Z suspended the search. They said they could not find the Nina, so maybe she sank. The RCC and Z says they wait until boats miss their scheduled arrival in port before they start searching, because they get thousands of reports of overdue yachts, nearly all of which do show up in time. The New Zealand area responsibility is one of the largest in the world. New Zealand taxpayers bear the sole responsibility for paying for searches in the New Zealand area of responsibility. Only about four million people live in New Zealand. The protocol used in search and rescue has been crafted over centuries. In 1913, the International Convention for the Safety of Life at Sea, SOLAS, was created to address the Titanic disaster in which nations placed minimum requirements on ships. The Titanic didn't have enough lifeboats and agreed upon geographical areas of responsibility for rescue by various nations. The convention was updated in 1974 to incorporate private boats and yachts. It went into effect in 1980. If the Nina had reported a position a few miles west of Evi Nemeth's last coordinates, the primary search obligation would have fallen on Australia. As it is, the RCC and Z position of waiting until a ship fails to arrive in port on time before a physical search is launched, unless an emergency is declared, is a rule that all RCC organizations follow. Perhaps it is time to rethink. A new system, called the Automatic Identification System, is mandatory for most commercial shipping. It provides a constant monitoring of a ship's position using other ships, short-range VHF systems, and satellites. The system is unpopular with private boat owners because it uses more power than is often available on sailboats. Some ship owners use the system cautiously for fear pirates may learn of their positions. The following is the actual conversation between the families and the Rescue Coordination Center, New Zealand. You'll hear Sue Wooten, mother of Matthew Wooten, Ricky and Robin Wright, the parents of crew member Danielle Wright, and Nigel Clifford from the RCCNZ, speaking about why it took so long for the RCCNZ to finally send search aircraft. If you hadn't have waited for three weeks before you started looking for her, wouldn't the area have been smaller? Correct. Yes. So, but why did you wait? Because it was by the 14th that there was a big problem? No, no. So if we take a thousand incidents of recreational blue water yachtsmen going on large oceanic voyages and being overdue, 999 times there are perfectly logical explanations and they turn up. So the world's standard practice is to work out when the vessel might be expected to arrive at its destination, commence straight away trying to get more information. So there's a transmission to try and contact the ship. You ask all the passing ships what's going on and everything. But the standard practice is not to begin active searching unless there's, for example, a radio message or an alert or a distress beacon. But that's a, that's a, not, not, but there's, there are no messages that raise any alarm or any 
concern or as, as far as we're aware or any statements about requiring any help from the control room. No, but that's, people miss calls all the time. No, like you say, all the time. you're talking about the undelivered message. No, I'm talking about the nurse call-in that they said that to the bar that they would call in at yeah. 6 o'clock. Okay, but, but, uh, we, you know, that's a, but the point is, that happens all the time. So we see the water ocean recreational yachts and all the time go, I'll be in Fiji in six weeks' time, eight weeks later, no, and they keep it scheduled, talking to people, and they have a problem, they lose the radio, they lose that aerial. It happens all the time. So, so what I'm trying to say is international best practice around blue water recreational sailors who quite often don't keep schedules, don't stick to their plans, turn up at random intervals. It's the way the authorities, Australia, America, New Zealand, Canada, everybody else, they work on communication searches, predicted time of arrival and active searching, unless there is some other alert. This is how it works. We didn't take into account the hurricane force. Okay, so, yes, we did. So, what we did, we contacted all the other vessels that we could find. We said, oh, yeah, the storm was bad, but we're okay. So, it's entirely feasible that the vessel can't communicate, but it's actually fine. But the problem is, we have hundreds of alerts every year, and you don't go and look at every one without it being sufficiently compelling. I know this is just all recorded into a map and go on. No. 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 Altitude. Altitude. Yeah, 40 feet. Anytime you're ready. Uh, we're just doing the last couple of things. Altitude. Altitude. Okay. I'm ready. Everything remains the same. Altitude. He's got the uh, survivor, so we'll keep it with a mask. Brief is complete. Roger, rescue check was complete, ready for one basket recovery of survivor. The bounty sank in Hurricane Sandy. 14 of the 16 crew members aboard her survived. The U.S. Coast Guard sent rescue crew after a radio mayday. Since there was no mayday from the Nina, the RCCNZ says they had no reason to launch a search. The RCCNZ says other sailors who crossed the Tasman Sea at the same time the Nina crossed, reported 30-foot waves and huge winds. But because they made it, the Nina could have made it too. The families want to know, shouldn't the 10-day radio silence from people who always call in, the Nina crew was in contact every single day, along with typhoon-sized wind and waves, why wasn't that enough to warrant an immediate search? This were just a game of cards. The RCC would come out a very big winner. Unfortunately, when the RCC and Z gets the odds wrong, when it's that one time out of 99, then this kind of poker puts a lot of lives at stake. In this case, the Nina 7. When the New Zealand search was suspended on July 5th, 2013, the families launched their own private search. My name is Dan Molina, and I am speaking this morning on behalf of Texas EquiSearch and an extraordinary group of families who you'll be meeting shortly. When people go missing, very dedicated people go out to search for them. They search until they are convinced that there is no reason to carry on with the search. They concluded that the time had come, that there was no justifiable reason for them to expend the resources and the time to carry on. And we certainly respect what they what they did and what they said, and we thank them for what they did. On the other hand, there are things that they did not perhaps take into consideration that perhaps we can work with them 
to better realize. And uh, those things include technology, the application of technology, uh, and they include the spirit of these people up here. Um, the seven crew on the Nina are not dead. John Kerry and the Department of State have said that they are. So I have a strong message here. And what I want you to do right now, how many people in the audience have cell phones? Raise your hands. I want every one of you to pick up your cell phone and I want you to dial this number right now. As soon as you dial that number, punch four. That'll get you an operator. When you get the operator, ask her to talk Secretary of State John Kerry's comment line and she'll put you through to the comment line. You'll punch one. When you punch, punch one, you can leave a message on the comment line. We need to let the Department of State know that we believe that these seven crew members are alive. That's what I've spent the last six weeks doing. I'm convinced of that. There is absolutely no evidence otherwise. There has been no evidence otherwise. I joined Texas EquiSearch in 2005 to help look for Natalie Holloway offshore Aruba because her uncle called and asked for some help. She didn't return home with her high school class from Aruba after being down there for Memorial Day weekend in 2005. Since that time, I've had so much respect for this organization, the work that they do, that I've stayed and worked with them for eight years. That's me. We all have that same example to talk about. Every one of our members, every one of our volunteers, there's 650 of us. The families, the five families contacted us because the New Zealand Rescue Coordination Center gave up. They stopped searching. A lot of these searches are administrative decisions. They may not be based on fact. They just may be administrative decisions. The effective days that they actually searched were two. They're broadcasting that they searched more than that, but they spent two days. We've spent a lot more than two days with private funds that we've gotten through donations. This isn't the way it should be done. Private resources shouldn't be taking the place of a government service, which is search and rescue. But what we've learned and what we're transmitting to all search and rescue that work in the marine environment particularly is to make use of resources that they're not currently making use of. And that's part of what we're doing here. The New Zealand government asked for help of the United States. They asked for help. The, the help they asked for was to task satellites. They said that they had contacted the NGA, which is the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. Foreign governments can contact this group. In this case, they contacted them through the New Zealand Embassy in Auckland, Australia. There was no continued contact with the NGA. There wasn't any tasking assigned. They asked for this help early on because they believed that the seven on the crew were alive and they needed help. What we've done is circumvented some of that. We're asking the Department of State to help us. They're stopping us from accessing satellites. We went around, we went to private corporations and we found a way to access satellites without going through normal government channels. And that was through Tomnod. And you've all heard about Tomnod, you've all visited the site. It's a tremendous activity. They're, the New Zealanders, the Kiwis, are so anxious to work with Americans. They love Americans, they love life. They believe these seven, they believe that these seven on the crew are alive when you talk to them. When I talk to the Kiwis, and I talk to the Australians, the Aussies, that's what they believe. When I talk to our authorities here in the United States, what they've done to the families is they've asked them for dental records. They've asked them, how can they identify the bodies? How do you want the bodies shipped home? Nobody in New Zealand is thinking that way. How did it change from positive thinking, not giving up, from the population not giving up to where we are here? It's administrative, and it has to do with the Department of State 
and it has to do with John Kerry's organization. We don't know who in the organization. It's so big, we don't know who, but there's a policy that should be changed to put government resources into play to help us. That the resources could be to advise and to assist the New Zealanders, the Rescue Coordination Center, and the New Zealand Air Force, Royal Air Force. It could also be that the United States could offer American resources and technology to help the New Zealanders find a ship that's lost in, in, their, in their sovereign waters. And that's what we're here to talk about today. We've got Tomnod, which is now a division of Digital Globe in Longmont, Colorado. They're expanding their business services so that these very sophisticated satellites can be made available to the general public. That's what Tomnod does. You can go and see these images. We went from just a couple tens and twenties and thirties of people, we went to 800 people, we went to 2,000 people on the web looking at these images. The last two days with the press release that we put out, the, the, the efforts are happening in the middle of the night. Well, that's the middle of the day in Australia. That's the middle of the day in, in New Zealand. So the people that are there are helping us Americans find our own. We also, once we find an image on the satellite, and we've got one that looks like a life raft, it really looks like a life raft, and we have uh, some people, every one of us, none of us are paid, we're all volunteers, we've got quite a network of scientists that are helping us that are connected with NASA, that are connected with the University of Colorado in Boulder, that are connected with Texas A&M, that are helping us. Every one of these people are putting in dedicated time after work hours to help us find the crew of the seven, the seven on the Nina. Mo most recent thing that's happened, and you'll get a copy of this, is we finally got our first letter from a congressman requesting some help, help that we asked for six weeks ago. It took six weeks to get somebody to write a letter, a formal letter with his signature, a congressman's signature, to get the information that we need. This congressman believes the crew of seven is alive. He wouldn't have written the letter. So we've got more things that we want to do just like that. We have uh, satellites that the NGA can task in the area. They can cover the entire Tasman Sea. It's a large area, but it's not much of a challenge for the NGA. They have that capability. For us to do this privacy, privately is going to take us months to do it privately. They can do it in days. We need visual air search with aircraft. We're, we're tasking our own airplane out of Norfolk Island to search in this high priority area. We're actually searching where the New Zealand RCC did not search before. Now we've got their interest because we're searching where they didn't search. They've asked us for new information. If we can provide them with new information from satellite, new information from Tomnod, new information from any air searches that we do, they will put their resources back in the air. They have not given up. Thank you. Uh, we, we would be remiss in not getting a few words right now from uh, the gentleman who founded Texas EquiSearch out of a tragedy in his own life uh, and is our leader, Tim Miller. I really don't want to be here. The only reason I'm here is because I did suffer uh, the loss of a child, my own self, only three miles from here. Uh, again, begged law enforcement, begged people to help, and got absolutely no help, none. Seventeen months later, Laura's body was found along with three other girls. Uh, two of them still unidentified, uh, still not in arrest. I never gave up. I can promise you all the day will come when there will be an arrest because I never gave up. You know, I made a promise to Laura and to God I would never leave a family alone because I knew what it alone was like. That's why I formed Texas EquiSearch. Uh, we've helped over 1,300 families. We've been in 38 states, 
eight different countries, all volunteers. Everybody asks me, why don't we quit this search? Y'all are wasting your time. You're wasting your money. We have other missing families. We are working six other cases in four different states right now as we speak. You know why we're not going to quit this? Because EquiSearch doesn't quit. We don't quit. Uh, God has blessed us. As of last week, it was a 164th body that we had found and at least brought closure to families because we did not quit. We brought over 300 people home alive. Many would have been dead. We found a little two-and-a-half-year-old boy in Llano, Texas, that was dead when I found him and brought him back to life. We don't know how to quit. And you know what? I'm going to give a prime example why we're not going to quit this search now for these, seven, for these seven people. I think these seven people are on that boat, and they're surviving right now, and they're saying, we're not going to quit, so why would you? We have a reason why we're not going to quit. I want to introduce a man, John Glenny. John, would you please come here, please? Today's the first day I met John Glenny. <laughs> Sorry if I'm emotional. John Glenny's boat went down kind of like in the same area. John Glenny never quit. 119 days later, he survived on his raft out there. And they're telling us to quit. We have proof with this man right here why we're not quitting. We got families that are begging us, don't quit. We are fighting our biggest fight that we can fight, and we need help. I think that we've got seven more John Glennies out there that we can bring home safely. The Great Southern Ocean is known as a marine desert. You know, there's no planes go down there, there's no ships, no one goes down there. In fact, there's no fish either. So when I tipped my boat up, I realised that I was going to have to create a major miracle to get out of it. And I never had one doubt in that whole four months that I'd ever get out, which is, um, that's another story which I'll tell you about on Friday. I'll tell you about miracles. What the Nina needs, because they are in, a, in another area and they are in the variables, they are not in a, an impossible situation and they don't need a miracle. All they really need is a miracle from us to look. My son Matthew um, left on his travels actually three and a half years ago. Um, he's very aware of his carbon footprint he's in, um, and he didn't want to fly anywhere. So he went by boat. Um, by bus, by car, uh, by train and by coach all over America and then to South America. Um, when he reached New Zealand, <clears throat> he um, bought himself a bike and cycled all around New Zealand, um, ending up in Apua, where he obviously met the Dix family and uh, sent us an email saying, Mum, Mum, I'm going to be sailing on this fantastic schooner the Nina. She's um, world class. She won the fast net race. She's actually um, the famous uh, flagship of the New York Yacht Club for um, 20 years, I believe. Um, and, uh, and then he wrote another email saying, I'm a bit fed up because I've been upside down in the bilge for hours and hours trying to uh, do something. I'm not quite sure. Somebody's hanging on to my legs. I believe that was Kyle. <laughs> and um, my husband wrote back to him and said, you know, well, you know, what do you expect? This is, you know, you're getting a free passage to Australia. Um, you've got to work for it, so stop complaining. And, um, and, and that's what he did. My earliest memories are of growing up on a sailboat, a Chinese junk in Florida. In April, we were actually in New Zealand and we found the Nina, or she drag us over to it to visit it and we had a happy hour on it and, um, met the families and Kyle was with us and we were all looking at the boat going wow this is a cool boat 
And she's like, yeah, and I'm going to get sail on it all the way over to Australia. But you're planning on going to Fiji. Yeah, but how often do I get a chance to ride on a boat like this? <laughs> that was heavy. You know, I mean, they're still out there. I was on the boat. I looked at that boat. I did not see what some people have been reporting, that it was a decrepit boat. It was in very nice shape. Hello, I'm Sally Davis, and this is my fiance, Dwayne Jackson. He's Kyle's father. One of the things that Amy has shared with me and with the rest of the family is Kyle's motto. Every time that Kyle traveled somewhere, she would worry about him, and he always told her, don't worry, Mom, remember my motto is, not all who wander are lost. Uh, we hope that you all uh, continue to support this search. Uh, we have not given up. The family has hope, and we need you to have hope and make those calls. Call John Kerry, please. This Kyle was a survivor. He wasn't a, wasn't a great sailor. He'd done just some sailing, but Kyle's been uh, a survival all of his life. He knows how to, he knows how to stay alive. He knows how to fish. He knows how to. He knows how to fend for himself and keep people ha uh, moods. Uh, he's he's a great kid and he uh, he knows how to survive. That's why I know they're alive. Thank you all for coming out today. Uh, we're Ricky and Robin Wright, and our daughter Danielle is on the Nina, and we do believe that all seven crew are alive and they're adrift out in the water. We met David uh, and Rosemary in Panama about four years ago. And we were just thrilled to see the Nina and to be on her. And we never had any doubt that she was in the best capable hands because we know who Captain David is and we know his training and his experience. And now that we've met the other family members and we've heard about Evie and her courage and her strength and Matthew and Kyle, and we just know that they are survivors and they are keeping each other up and they're doing everything possible to stay alive. They're catching fish. It's raining a lot, okay? They have a lot of, of water and maybe a turtle for dessert every now and then. So they're surviving, okay? They're doing everything they're ca they can. Um, and, and we know how possible it is that, that they're drifting. We think that they lost their mast we think that uh, there's no way they could motor that far. They can't carry the fuel. So we think they're just drifting out there. Um, there was a, uh, a three adults and two babies that were uh, rescued recently, 91 days. The same exact scenario. Lost their mast and drifted until someone found them. The area in the Tasman where our crew are, I mean, they are really in the middle of nowhere. And we don't have any hope that they're just gonna drift back to, to civilization anytime soon, okay? It might be three or four months. And do we, wanna, do we wanna wait and let them drift back to shore? I mean, every day, as a mother, I have to think about what it's like for my 100-pound daughter child. And if it were your child out there, I'm sure you would be doing the same exact thing. You would not be giving up. You would be asking people. You would be begging people to help you. Okay? And that's the reality. If they're in a life raft, they, they could be sick, they could be injured, and they could be in very dire circumstances right now. We need your help. And they can survive in a life raft. Steve Callahan, who we've talked with and, and consulted with, has survived 76 days on a life raft. And there are ways to be able to survive on life rafts. And we believe that they, if they are on a life raft, that they are still alive and kicking and paddling their way back to land. Please help us. Thank you. Thank you. This is about the makeup of the human spirit. It goes beyond organizations, it goes beyond desks, it goes beyond decision makers. It goes to our will, our understanding of who we are and what we are determined to do. There is evidence that says look more. That's what we want to do. Since the RCCNZ 
refused to conduct any more searches, the Nina families had little choice. They launched their own search. They met a Colorado firm called Digital Globe and convinced them to send satellites over the Tasman Sea. Using a program called Tomnod, also owned by Digital Globe, they were able to recruit over 16,000 volunteers to search the satellite images for the Nina. They held fundraisers. They asked family friends to help. They sent out search aircraft at their own expense. Ricky and Robin eventually went to New Zealand to help supervise in the searching for the Nina. Ralph Baird coordinated the effort from Texas. Larry Slack took charge of satellite images. Ian and Sue Wooten were pivotal in researching satellite images and areas of the Tasman Sea where the Nina might be located. Then one day, they found an image called the Lenore 62, named after one of the dedicated people who was searching. Would the RCCNZ send search craft? Despite their best efforts, the RCCNZ said it might be a wave or a cloud, but they didn't think it was a Nina. What do you think? We'll give you three guesses. Does this look like a cloud, a wave, or a boat? And so the search continued. And who could have thunk that all of these people would put this much time in as volunteers? But nobody at Texas EcuSearch gets paid. And in fact, volunteers from all over the world pitched in to help find the Nina, including John Funnell from New Zealand and so many more. So, so when you... When you see someone going through adversity, don't feel sorry for them. Just look at, just notice them and think, wow, there could be a, a greatness in that person. And it's the same with the people on the Nina, you know? They were leading their, they were following their dream. And you should all feel very, very proud of them. In speaking about the errors that were made by the RCCNZ in the search, which errors were underscored by the U.S. State Department, which put barriers in the way of the family seeking help from the United States of America, it would be unfair to say that New Zealand authorities didn't care. In fact, the families say they are eternally grateful for the efforts that were expended, and they know that the RCCNZ is staffed by very caring people. And as a matter of fact, Robin and Ricky Wright frequently speak about how New Zealand opened their hearts to the family looking for their lost daughter in the middle of the Tasman Sea. While they visited... But the thing is, they never found a thing of the Nina. And for all we know, the boat is still out there. Jose Alvarenga was out for over a year, with ships passing and doing nothing. All the families are saying is, when anyone goes missing, don't we owe an obligation to the missing people and to their families to do our very best to pull out every stop for nations to put their differences aside and work together in solving missing persons cases. Do people come back from the sea? You bet they do. Jose Alvarenga, January 2014.
He self-rescued from the sea after 438 days adrift in an open boat with no provisions. He survived by eating turtle meat and catching fish and drinking turtle blood. Jose said he was spotted by many ships, but no one stopped. The crew on a few ships even waved. Jose was unable to walk on his own when he reached land. As his rescuers were helping him walk, he fell to his knees and prayed. Crew member Ezekiel Cordova perished during the journey. John Glennie and three other crewmates survived Rose Noel for 119 days, eating mostly fish. John said they were floating back to New Zealand under the airport takeoff pattern, but jets didn't monitor the emergency frequency until they left the contact with tower. The Gaston Way family was rescued after being stranded for weeks at sea when their EPIRB device, Emergency Position Indicating Rescue Beacon, failed. They had been at sea for months, but considered themselves lost only for the last few weeks. The sloop the Scotch Bonnet was abandoned in the middle of the Tasman Sea near where the Nina disappeared, and she turned up six and a half months later on an Australia beach. Both her forward and main hatchways were open during the entire trip, yet she survived. Lim Poon survived 133 days on a raft in the southern Atlantic. He was rescued by fishermen, and in 1942, he said he hoped no one would ever have to break his record. Many have had to break the record since then. Because the biggest search in the history of New Zealand was searching in the wrong areas, and because most of the search was done by radar, which might not pick up a wooden vessel lying low behind the waves. You can't tell from the New Zealand search whether the Nina is there or not. But if all these other sailors have come back from the sea, why can't the Nina 7, as some of us call them, why can't David Dyke, Rosemary Dyke, David Jr., Matthew Wooten, Danielle Wright, Kyle Jackson, and Professor Evie Nemeth why? Why can't they come back from the sea too? Nothing of the Nina has ever been found. And for all we know, she's still out there today. For the Nina 7, and for all adventurous spirits, the families ask you to take the following action.